that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? Now here's another problem the Pharisees had with Christ. They couldn't stump him. They couldn't beat him. They couldn't pin him down. Leaving them with really only one of two options. We either have to believe in him or kill him. And by Luke 14, it's starting to look pretty obvious which option they're going to go with. We're probably only months away from the cross. The plot to kill Christ has already been discussed by this point. But as of yet, his opponents haven't figured out just how they're going to spring the trap. But that doesn't stop them from setting little traps for him along the way. And I think that's what we have here in Luke 14. It's a trap. It's a plot, as meager as it is, to try to once again catch Jesus doing something wrong. Now, we know that the Pharisees could never catch Christ in anything, but it seems that one of the areas that they believe that they might be getting a little bit of traction is, is on this area of Jesus' Sabbath, Sabbath observances, or, or lack thereof. Now, you know all of the rules that the Pharisees had made with regard to the Sabbath, or, or maybe I should say you don't know all of the rules. Nobody did. Okay? There was just too many of them. The Pharisees had tried to figure out just what activities might constitute work. For example, they considered lighting a candle on the Sabbath work. Mm. Well, it's not that hard to light a candle, and quite honestly, it's easier to use a candle than stumble around in the dark. But nevertheless, it was, in their estimation, work. Okay? And, and true story, to this day, Orthodox Jews still, the day before the Sabbath, take down that little trigger on the refrigerator door, you know, that sets the light off when you open the door, such that the light doesn't come on when they open the refrigerator door, thus, thus doing work, <laughs> by, by turning a light off. Okay. Now, not always, but often, what, accompany, what accompanies legalism is a lack of compassion. Particularly, it, it displays itself in a lack of compassion for people under the weight of the burdens that you're piling on top of them. And this, among other things, but especially this abuse of people, Jesus took particular offense at. And these first six verses of Luke 14 is a prime example of that. Jesus teaches them and us a valuable lesson that they didn't learn, nor did they apply, but, but we must. And here it is. It's, it's very simple, but there's a very important point for us to put into practice, and it's this. Compassion is better than rule-keeping. Compassion is better than rule-keeping. And listen, I'm not saying that rules and laws and God's commands can be overlooked. Okay, that's not the type of rules I'm talking about. I'm talking about the legalistic rule-keeping of the Pharisees or personal rules that you establish on your own. When you have a choice between observing your own personal rules or showing compassion, go with compassion. In verses 1 through 2, Luke records for us the trap. And here's the trap. Which one will Jesus choose? Will he choose to obey the rules or show compassion? And that's why I called point number one the trap. Rules or compassion? And we know this is a, a no-brainer. It's obvious which one Jesus is going to pick. But let's look at the masterful way that he does it. Verse 1 sets up the context for us. Verse 1, it happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. Okay, so we're given some information about the host and the occasion. The occasion you're familiar with, it's Sabbath day, and Jesus has been invited over for a Sabbath lunch. Okay, so think of a big potluck dinner. After, after Sunday church, but instead of little old ladies with chicken noodle casserole, okay, the hosts and the guests are a bunch of Pharisees with their briefcases, which who have been assembled to watch Jesus 
closely. And not so that they can emulate him, but so that they can trap him and have the pleasure of jumping up and yelling, Aha! <laughs> right? Luke tells us that the host is one of the leaders of the Pharisees. He's a chief Pharisee, a prominent Pharisee, possibly one of the members of the Sanhedrin. So he's an important guy in their world. He's among the ruling class of the Pharisees. Now, if you've been studying the book of Luke, you would know that that alone should tip you off that maybe this guy is about to be knocked down a few notches. Because a key theme in the Gospel of Luke is God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. And this guy is among the proud. Okay, so you know he's about to be humbled. And I think Luke is showing us that this is, we have everything set up for the perfect storm. Okay? And sure enough, because this Sabbath lunch controversy doesn't end in verse 6, this conversation goes all the way through verse 24. Jesus actually gives three discourses at this man's house, each one accusing the Pharisees of some sin or injustice. He not only accuses the hosts, he also accuses the guests at the party for good measure. So, Jesus really knows how to light and live up a party. But they had it coming, because look at the malice that they're displaying. And you know what malice is. Malice is the desire to see someone fail. Right? I hope they lose. I hope they trip and fall and, and stumble. And that's exactly what they wanted from Jesus. In fact, look at the last phrase of verse 1 again. They were watching him closely, they being the lawyers and, their Phar and the Pharisees. So Jesus at this one man's house, but there's a whole host of Pharisees with their lawyers present. Okay, so just a side note, if you're ever invited to someone's house for dinner, and you arrive there, and there's a collection of lawyers wearing suits sitting around the table, and you think of somewhere else you need to be. And the verb there, we're watching him closely, means to observe scrupul scrupulously, or to watch maliciously. It can even be translated to lie and wait for. Okay, it's the way that a hawk sits on a pole and watches a mouse in a field that he's about to scoop down and consume. Okay. And, and, and the sad thing was, this is not how they just watched Jesus on this occasion. This is how they watched him all of the time. Okay, and that's an emotionally draining thing. Right? Mm -hmm. Some of you are pastors or would-be pastors, and you know sometimes there's people in church who look at you like this, right? <laughs> and it's, it's just emotionally a draining thing. And, and this is what Jesus endured day after day after day. But what can they accuse Christ of? I mean, even here, dinner hasn't even started yet. In fact, verse 7, we find out they haven't even sat down yet. But Luke shows us something in verse 2 that might present a problem. Look at that. And there, in front of him, was a man suffering from dropsy. And I'm going to call this tr the trap. Because okay, that's what this was. Now it seems that this man is a plant. Okay, you know what I mean when I say that. I don't mean a, you know, an actual plant. I, I, I think he's been planted there by the Pharisees and the lawyers so as to test Jesus. Now the text does not say this. And it was not uncommon for people in Palestine to wander into homes when there was a famous rabbi there. Homes were very open. People kind of had the luxury of walking in. Maybe that's how that guy got there. However, Luke shows us a couple of things to indicate that this might be a plot. The first thing is the first phrase of verse 2 again. And there in front of him was this man. In fact, in the Greek, the first words are actually, and behold, which the writers of Scripture sometimes use to show that that a surprising twist has taken place. And as well, Luke tells us that the man was right in front of Jesus. So get the idea, hey, Jesus, come over to my house. Jesus walks in the front door, and here, right in front of him, <laughs> is this man standing in the living room with this condition. Did the Jews plant him there? We don't know. I think they did. If you don't think so, that's fine. Jesus agrees with me. <laughs> at least I think he does. I think he does. Say that. Because look at what Jesus says to everyone in the room, even before he heals the man. Okay, and that's found in verse 3. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Notice nobody's even said anything yet. So maybe Jesus knows what they're thinking. And by the way he asks the question, I think he's... I think he, he 
knows that something's fishy here. And this was nothing new. The Jews and the Pharisees often did things to try to trap Jesus, but just think how cold and compassionless this one is. Wow. I mean, here you've got a person suffering mm -hmm. with a disease, uh, one that probably makes him look uh, pathetic. But rather than seeking to help him, these shepherds of Israel are trying to use him as bait. In fact, they condemned people like this as sinners, as you know. They believed blindness was a consequence from sin. Dropsy in particular, as we will see, they connected with sin in particular. <coughs> they didn't really care about the well-being, the physical well-being of the infirm. If they wanted them healed at all, it was only so they could accuse Jesus of doing it on the Sabbath. They never rejoiced when Jesus healed somebody. You ever notice that? And sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, the healed person was interrogated by them. I remember the guy in John chapter 9, and even at the end of verse 4, after Jesus performs this miracle, he dismisses the guy, possibly despairing from, from being interrogated. And for these Pharisees, they must have thought that this little trick was a good one, because think about the dilemma that they believe that they're making for Jesus. If Jesus heals the man, then they can again accuse him for breaking the Sabbath because he healed this guy. If he refuses to heal the man, what will they say? He lacks compassion. Here's this poor guy right in front of him, and he does nothing. Now, we know that Jesus heals the man, but in a minute here, we're going to see how Christ did it and how he turns the tables on the Pharisees so that they're the ones left with the dilemma. Now Luke tells us that this man is suffering with dropsy. Dropsy, or as it's sometimes called edema, is an abnormal swelling of the body due to excessive water buildup. Uh, the condition in Greek is actually called hydro epikos. Okay, so hydro hydro means water. So the problem has to do with water retention. A dropsy is actually not a disease in and of itself. It's actually a symptom of a greater problem of the body. So the man's body had some kind of internal organ disease. It could be in his kidneys, maybe his liver, his blood, or, or more commonly, the heart. Whatever it was, it prevented his body from successfully passing fluids through the body, so it would build up and make him excessively bloated. Right? This caused many problems for the man. Obviously, he had some major issue with some internal, internal organ. As well, he is in danger of infection because his body is not properly eliminating waste. Uh, he would feel physical discomfort of all kinds pretty much all of the time. And people with drops here are noted for being incredibly thirsty all of the time, because their body is not absorbing fluids properly. Mm. Now, in Numbers 5, verses 11 through 27, a very interesting passage of Scripture that we won't look at right now, but there is actually a curse recorded there, and the, the curse is actually a test that was given to a wife that was accused of adultery by her husband. And if the woman retained water and became bloated, it was a sign that she was guilty. And you can look it up on your own. Believe it or not, it's really there. Because that bloating was associated with sin, and in particular adultery, people with dropsy who were bloated were oftentimes considered sinners and sometimes even accused of adultery. It was not necessarily the case. In fact, seldom was the case. But that was the accusation which may be exactly why the Pharisees selected this guy for the trap. Because he's kind of like the woman caught in adultery in John 8 and the blind man from John 9 all wrapped into one, such that if Jesus heals him, there's a whole assortment of accusations that they can make. Hmm. Now, there's no question as to what Jesus is going to do. Here is a man suffering in front of him. <coughs> Compassion dictates that you help him if you can and Christ's compassion was so acute, it seems that he couldn't resist helping a hurting person in his presence on the Sabbath day or any other day of the week. In fact, in the healing of the woman in the chapter before this, not only was it the Sabbath when she entered the synagogue for help, Jesus was actually in the midst of his teaching when he stopped and helped her. Luke 13, 12 says, when Jesus saw her, he called her over. So there's an interesting picture here. Jesus is teaching, and you know, as you teach or you preach, you kind of pan the audience and you look at people, and sometimes you see a face that you didn't recognize before. So he sees this woman, he stops mid-teaching and immediately calls her over and heals her. 
The point is, there's no time to waste. She's hurting now. Helping her is appropriate. Why wait? Let's heal her right now. The Pharisees wanted a day to go by before she could get healing. But compassion dictates that, that the present is always the right time for doing good. Amen. Now back to our guy with edema. Dropsy or edema is not, liter not immediately life-threatening. So Jesus could have said, Hey pal, come back tomorrow and I will heal you. And the man gets healed and the Pharisees are prevented from an opportunity to squawk. But had Christ done that, not only would he have validated the Pharisees' false claims that healing should not be done on the Sabbath, but also it would justify the false position that rule-keeping is better than compassion. And that's just not correct. Now is always the best time to help someone. Amen. And the moment there is a need that you can meet is the moment you should meet the need. Sometimes we, we want people to grovel. Sometimes we want them to show an element of respect to us before we give them our health. That we, they have to prove that they're worthy of our assistance. But when we look at Christ's example, how can we think that? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Out of the people that Christ healed, which one of them was actually worthy? Mm -hmm. None, right? Because they were all sinners. And think about this man. He may have even been a part of the Pharisees' plot. But Jesus requires nothing of him. Jesus doesn't say, what's the magic word? Jesus doesn't say, well, you better be thankful for this bow. <laughs> Jesus doesn't even expect and require faith from the man. Mm. Sometimes people say, Jesus only healed people who had faith in him. That's not true at all. Mm. Many of the people that Jesus healed displayed no faith in him. Jesus did not heal this man because he'd earned it. He healed him because Christ was compassionate. Amen. Compassion is kindness to those in need, not simply kindness to those who are worthy. And how thankful are we that that's true? Amen. Because if we had to be worthy of God's compassion, <clears throat> how much would we receive? <laughs> so we know what Jesus is going to do. He's going to heal the man, but Christ is so good, he's going to put the Pharisees in their place at the same time. So this takes us to number two, the question. Point number two, the question. And the question, is compassion, is compassion should be shown or not? Look specifically at the question that Jesus asked his opponents in verse 3, Luke 14, 3. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now remember, so far the Pharisees and scribes have yet to say anything. So I think Luke is showing that Jesus knows this whole thing is a sin. This is his way of saying, I see it coming. Right? I, I, I know what you're up to. So he puts them on the hot seat. And he has a question for them, and it's a good one. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And this isn't a rhetorical question. This is, this is a real question. Jesus expects from them an answer. I mean, they're defining healing someone as work. But... Come on, you guys are scribes, you're experts of the law. Find me a verse in the law that defines healing as work, much less abstaining, much less work that should be abstained from on the Sabbath. Go ahead, I've got my Torah right here. I'm ready to turn to the appropriate passages. Where does it say I shouldn't heal on the Sabbath? And they got nothing. So where do they get this notion that Jesus can't heal on the Sabbath? Well, the rabbis of the day, who they often appealed to, said this, said this about helping somebody on the Sabbath. If a person's life was in danger, if they might die, then you can help them on the Sabbath. But if their life was not in jeopardy, then you should wait till tomorrow. How stupid is that? When is the time to show compassion? Now. Right when there's a need. And why would anybody wait any longer? Because they like rules more than compassion. And think about how faulty their logic is. Only help someone on the Sabbath if they might die otherwise. Okay, let's, let's apply Occam's razor to this. Okay? <laughs> let's get rid of the non-essentials in the argument. Let's just get down to the main point. Life or death really play no part in the equation. And the Sabbath day really plays no part in the equation. 
the question ultimately comes down to this. Is helping someone in need a good thing or a bad thing? If it's a bad thing, it should never be done. And if it's a good thing, then it should be done at the time of need for help, regardless of the severity of the need. That's it. Whether the person might live or die, or what day of the week it is, should have no bearing on a display of compassion. If compassion should be shown at all, it should be shown immediately. Does that make sense? Amen. The Jews had misinterpreted the law. They defined work on the Sabbath differently than God had. And they completely misrepresented the heart of God when it comes to helping people. Because God's view is this. Every day is a good day to display compassion. <laughs> Jesus took that even farther in Luke chapter 6. Jesus argues that the Sabbath day is the best day to show compassion. Because the Sabbath was given by God to man as a gift. It's a day of worship. It's a day of rest. It's a day of celebration. How better to celebrate that day than to help somebody? And to help them so that they can enjoy the day. Anyway, back to Jesus' question. Jesus is basically saying, show me from the Bible why I should not heal this man. Jesus said to his disciples that they should be crafty as serpents, and Jesus was that. Jesus employs a very a great tactic here. He asked them what he should do. Before healing the man, Jesus asked them what to do. I mean, if you have a legitimate reason to stop me, by all means, speak up. And if they don't have a reason to stop him, and they have nothing contrary to say now, then really they have no grounds by which to accuse him later. See what Jesus did there? If later they say, you shouldn't have healed him, then Jesus could say to them, why didn't you say that earlier when I asked you if it was lawful or not? There's a room full of lawyers here with their leather briefcases. Speak up now or forever hold your peace. So they tried to set a trap for Christ, but Jesus uh, puts them, you know, they fell in the, in the pit that they dug for him. Because look at what the first part of verse 4 says. But they kept silent. Maybe one of two reasons for the silence. Obviously, they remained silent because they didn't know how to respond. <laughs> Possibly also they kept silent because they wanted Jesus to heal the man, and not because they had compassion, but so they could accuse him if he did. The two sentences of verse 4 are interesting when taken as a whole. Look at that. But they kept silent, and he, Christ, took hold of him and healed him. I think Luke is subtly making this point. While they stood there with their mouths open and no answer doing nothing, Jesus acted out of compassion. I think it's illustrative of what you always see with Jesus and the Pharisees. They stand by doing nothing helpful, and Jesus acts and helps. And I think there's a great application question that we can ask ourselves here. Am I the type that's quick to help? Am I the type that is content to, to jump in there, or, or am I content to stand by and let somebody else jump in first? Right? Uh, I'll let somebody else speak up about Christ. Right? You ever been with a Christian friend and somebody's an unbeliever comes up and you're talking to them, and you're like, which one of us is going to share the gospel? Right? Or, or waiting. Uh, I wait for somebody.